All right, everyone, we are ready to get things started. Um, I'd like to start by saying thank you, everyone, for joining. My name, of course, Cody Armstrong. Uh, this webinar is going to be a bit different than our typical webinars. Today's webinar is really going to be focused on questions from you to our CEO and co-founder, John Hirschte. So I'm um, really going to be a different tone. Uh, we're going to jump into you know, a number of different topics that you then let you kind of steer the conversation. So really going to be an interactive webinar. Um, and we really thank John for taking the time to, to answer all these questions. So before I'd like before we get into the AMA, I'd like to give you a brief introduction to John. For those not familiar with John, I'll give you just a simple intro uh, into his background. So of course, John is the co-founder and CEO of Onshape. Uh, as I mentioned before, he holds a bachelor's and master's from MIT. He's been in the cat industry for over 30 years now, so definitely uh, what many would consider a legend in the industry. Uh, as founder and CEO of SolidWorks, those familiar with SolidWorks, um, John was among the team that created them, uh, created it, right? Uh, director of Engineering at Computer Vision, Group Executive at Dassault, Manager at the MIT CAD Lab, um, but probably my personal favorite player and instructor on the MIT Blackjack team, and also professional magician. So very cool resume, um, and you know, definitely, as I mentioned before, a legend in the industry. Um, he also serves on several boards, Engineering Advisory Board at Boston University, Magic Leap Board, the Mark Forged Board. So um, again, someone that's very involved in, in, in our world. Um, his hobbies include golf, 3D printing, ten tennis, yoga, and of course, as I mentioned, magic. So that is a brief introduction for those that are not familiar with John. Um, as I mentioned before, this is really intended to allow you to ask any questions that you'd like. So please use that questions function in the GoToWebinar control panel to ask any question that you'd like. What I'd like to do is turn things over for just a few minutes to John to give a brief introduction and a current state or status of Onshape, uh, and then we'll, we'll dive right into things. So, John, I'll turn things over to you. Thank you, Cody. Um, and by the way, great honor to be with the famous Cody, who is the star of so many of our wonderful uh, videos um, uh, in the Onshape world. Well, it's been a great year. And the first thing I have to say is thank you to all of our customers out there. Uh, your support has meant everything uh, to us. Um, the, the year has really featured some amazing progress with our product. Uh, we introduced our new Onshape Enterprise Plan and also our release management uh, capability uh, this year. Those were two really big chapters in the Onshape story. We had planned to have those all along. We had architected our system for them, and we are so proud and happy to introduce those to you this year, and reaction's been great. I think the power of what our new generation architecture offers to users through the use of cloud, web, and mobile technology that was already really strong. I think those have become even stronger with the introduction of release management and workflow and enterprise. It's also been a great year for all kinds of other product features, things like simultaneous bill of materials mentioned here, where we took a little bit different approach to bill of materials, which has, I think, paid off really well. Um, and uh, improvements across the board and everything from configurations, um, performance, and so many improvements uh, to drawings as always, and many, many things that you see in our every three week updates. Um, we now have, it's been a big year for customer growth as well. Um, again, thank you to you. We now have thousands of companies who have purchased Onshape and those range from customers who have one subscription of Onshape and are indeed a one person company, up to companies that have purchased over a million dollars in Onshape subscriptions and everything in between. Um, and the best news is we are continuing to provide what you tell us is top quality support even as we grow. And so we are trying very hard to maintain those great Onshape support experiences that you like um, we're trying to maintain that as we grow. Big shout out to uh, Lou Gallo and the Onshape support team, who I know many of you know so well. So it's not just about building software here, it's about giving you the support and the application partners and the whole experience that you need. We love your feedback. That's our best source of ideas. We love watching you work. And we do, as it says here, 
we um, channel what we learn from you into improving everything we do here. So um, with that, it's, it's, this is always a, a, one of my favorite things is to take questions from you. Uh, we'll try to answer as many as you can. I'm gonna ask uh, Cody and um, another colleague of mine here from Onshape Kim is on the line as well to um, be prepared to um, help me with answers. And you, you, Cody will explain how you post questions. And also I know that Kim and Cody may be posting some information like URLs and things into the chat area on the GoToWebinar. So with that, Cody, you wanna kick it off with um, uh, questioning and perhaps explaining questions? Sure. All right, so the first thing to keep in mind is how, um, you know, getting your questions answered by John is done via the questions section of the GoToWebinar control panel. So there's a questions section and you go to webinar control panel, type in your question, um, hit you know the, the send and we will bring it up here in our questions panel. Um, I also have some questions that were sent in beforehand via email, so some of them will not be coming from uh, today's webinar, but will be coming from emails sent in the past. So uh, we'll try our best to get as, as many, uh, to get to as many of these questions as we can, right? So bear with us. Um, and I think we'll just jump right into things. All right, so one of the most common questions that we received via email um, was it was one that was asked several times was with regards to Magic Leap One and the and the recent announcement that was made. Um, so in general, uh, it was asked a few different ways, a few different times. But what more can you tell us about Onshape on the Magic Leap One? Okay, um, well, Onshape on Magic Leap One, it, our vision of it is that it's a, another full. CAD application like we do on phones and tablets and browser, that it's a real CAD application. It's not a, it's a, what it's not is, it's not a viewer for a finished design. Our vision is that it become a active part of your design, meaning that you use it either standalone as your Onshape client, looking at live Onshape data, which is what we showed, um, or you use it in conjunction with other devices, just like many of you tell me you use multiple browser sessions or you'll have your phone or tablet open while your browser is open, we imagine that you might use the magically client for Onshape open while you're using your phone or, um, or tablet or browser as well. So sort of multi-device um, work at the same time. That could be a really great use case. Um, right now, it, it, it is a full client in that it so you see live on shape data in the Magic Leap device. Really exciting in that way. You know, it's really live models. You know, if you make an edit on any other device, you see it update in real time. Um, what we're trying to understand is where to go with adding in more functions into it. We have markup in, we have the live, um, uh, live model uh, interaction that you see. We have some interesting um, uh, controls for it where you can use the Magic Leap control to manipulate it. There's some sectioning in there and we will eventually add more features into it and we're still deciding based on feedback with you the best design and approach to those and exactly which ones to add in what order. Okay. Um, one question that was kind of tied on to that same theme was uh, what does the future of CAD on the keyboard and mouse look like? Is it doomed? Was the question that was asked. Um, I don't think CAD on keyboard and mouse is doomed. I think the keyboard and mouse, and by the way, the 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 the, the um, space con the 3D connection products as well, which I personally use. I I have two of those that I use. Um, one at home, one at the office. I think those are are all really strong devices, and they're not going to go away. And I think we have plenty more work to do on those too. Okay, so um, this was a question that was sent in via email, and it sounds like kind of a general question. Who were the winners and losers in the CAD arena historically, and what are the factors that are shaping the industry now? Wow. So um, winners and losers historically in the CAD arena. Well, I think you've seen – first of all, I've been around the business a long time, 37 years. I've seen generations of, of CAD um, come and go. And I saw companies, you know, in the old days, there were companies like Computer Vision, Applicon, and CADAM, and those gave way to others. And, you know, today, 
Certainly, uh, my old company, SolidWorks, is very strong. Um, uh, uh, you have, um, you know, certainly DASA Systems, PTC, very strong companies out there. I think what's happening today is you have very strong um, users who have um, traditional file-based CAD systems from many years ago, and uh, they already have them and they're in use. And so you have that kind of concept. And then you have the advantages of our new generation platform. We believe we are the only full cloud architecture out there. It's proven to offer all kinds of benefits to people. And what I see is more and more users appreciating that and uh, moving over to our approach. Right now, we don't see any um, similar architecture to ours that's been released. People are talking about it. I'm sure you'll see more moving our way. That's clearly something that the industry agrees on. I think the industry agrees that our kind of approach is the future to one degree or another, but they're just not moving there quite as fast. And I think um, these products are all going to be around a while. I don't think they're going to go away. I just think that those who, who um, have more emphasis on the uh, traditional environment and you know keeping their old system in place will use those and those who want to move the fastest and take advantage of the speed and innovation advantages um, of our kind of approach will move to us and um, that's that's where we are it's an exciting time a lot of other things going on a lot of exciting developments in simulation software with with mesh free simulation people like SimSolid using cloud for things like rendering as well. People like um, a one render reality server um, and also a lot of use of, um, of uh, 3D printing coming on additive, why we support mesh format and part studios. So a lot happening that's changing the environment and it's as always a question of do you, do you stick with what you got because it's familiar or do you move to something new because it's better? And eventually, everyone's going to move, like we've seen in previous generations. Okay, so a question that I've seen asked a few different ways, both in the question section to go to webinar and also via email, uh, is what about uh, PMI or, or building in the bar, uh, the part manufacturing data into the model, right? So PMI, look, we'd love to do PMI. We don't have anything to announce yet, but I think someday we will have it, and I. I appreciate how many of you are asking us about it. I think, again, we have some interesting things that we can do because of our architecture um, and use in browser. But again, we don't have a, anything to announce now. But yes, we would love to be, we'd love to be doing it. It's not, look, it's not going to be there next, next release or the one after. It's not going to be there um, in the immediate near future. It's not close to release. It's something that it would be in our longer term future. Okay, another question that was asked is, um, what do you think of Apple Pencil and, and its applications for CAD? So Apple Pencil, um, I, I was pretty excited about it. We actually built some Apple Pencil specific features into our iPad app, on shape on iPad. I don't know if anyone's tried it, but if you use the, um, the pressure on the pen, you can use it on the pencil, excuse me, on the screen, you, it will zoom in on your selection, let you select, and then when you release, it bounces back. Very cool little feature we put in. Um, uh, I think that there's a lot of potential for pencil apps, but much like I said about Magic Leap, we're not sure where to go with it next. And we're not getting a lot of users telling us that that's a priority. Of course, that doesn't always mean that it's not a priority, as we sometimes observe it to be. But I would, I would hope that as we see more users use Apple Pencil, we'd get a little more momentum behind it and we could do, there's definitely more we could do with it. It's a very capable, um, a very capable device. Okay, next question. How do you handle users who do not like to use cloud, such as they name Toyota and, and Defense and a few other industries? By the way, I, I see that that question is asked by a good friend of mine, and I want to say welcome to that friend as well as some of the other ones I see here. I'm not going to call you by name because it's your confidential information, but I welcome um, some old friends and new here. And uh, big shout out to all you I've known a long time. Um, users, yeah, some users, I'd say with respect to cloud, there's three kinds of users. There's those that um, view cloud as favorable, you know, or neutral that understand 
the um, security advantages of the cloud. There's those that um, just refuse to use it and say, hey, we it's got to be on site or we're not going to use it or they're in an isolated like I, I've been to facilities that are just physically isolated. There is no Internet access. You're not allowed to bring phones in places like that. We're not the solution for those places. And, you know, if you need if you really need an installed on premises system, there are plenty to choose from, like the ones I built in my old life. And the third group are people who are sort of maybe people. They're like, hey, well, you know, tell me more about what's going on. I'm not convinced either way. I might have a predisposition one way or another, whether um, it's better or not. And with those kinds of people, we have a, a great um, uh, presentation that compares uh, security of cloud with security of most existing CAD environments. And when you compare that, I think what we find is people will pretty, um, pretty quickly realize that we have a more secure approach, inherently more secure. I get into all the reasons. We also recently um, have been pursuing a SOC 2 security approval, which those of you who know what that is will recognize. That's a very high level of formal endorsement of our security procedures. We do some, uh, we're very proud to soon, we'll, we'll soon be having that um, uh, completed. And that's another thing. We're increasingly passing rigorous security criteria through these presentations. Anyone who's interested in learning more about a security story, we can certainly arrange for our um, one of our team here to give you a, a more in-depth briefing on that security comparison. We also, um, I think, have had a webinar in the past. Is that right, Kim? Um, okay. Yeah, maybe maybe I'll ask Kim to um, put that URL out there if people are interested. But so that's that's the story on that, Cody. Okay, so the next one is an assemblies question. Why are there no planes in assembly studios? Oh boy, why are there no planes in assembly studios? Well, uh, we just haven't gotten around to it, I think, right? Uh, Cody, I know, Cody, let me guess, you'd like them, right? I, I, I think there are genuine cases for them, but I think that yeah. you can also easily use make connectors, right? So, there yeah, I think them. that's what we found is that, that we, would, we would like to have them, but, but, uh, people use our, our mate connectors um, pretty well, and uh, I, but I would say undoubtedly we would. It's a question of 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 when, not if. And uh, those of you who are familiar with the pace of development, you know, in our three week releases, sooner or later you'll probably see it in there. Um, but uh, again, that long list. But plenty of ways to get your job done. If you're not able to to quite see how to get the job done check with support or check again. We have some um, training materials and pre-recorded re webinars on assembly practices, right, Cody? Yeah, and it goes over a lot of detail. I think in many situations, main connectors are faster than planes just because of the need to turn them off. Oh, off. that's a good point, yeah. So it, yeah, it really right, depends. it's a little different way to work. Right, yeah, All right so the, the next question is, what is the vision for weldments in the future? So we would love to, um, do a great job with weldments, kind of like we've done with sheet metal. It's something we are planning. And uh, with, you know, again, I have to just say to you, we don't tend to come out with release dates, but that's one that is, is um, I would say, a um, getting to be a priority for us to be building in the not too distant future. But don't expect it in the next, you know, in the next release or two. Um, it's going to be out there way, but. I would hope that, you know, next time I do an Ask Me Anything, I would be able to tell you that we're working on it more actively, thinking about it a lot, would love to have it, and want to do a super job on it when we do, but definitely part of our vision. All right, so next question. How many of the users are currently using Onshape on tablet and mobile? Um, about one out of six Onshape sessions are on phones and tablets. Uh, that's, that's the answer, and qu so quite a bit. The average duration on mobile and tablet sessions, and by those I mean, of course, iPad, iPhone, Android tablets, and Android phones all together. Um, and uh, average session duration is a little shorter. People are doing editing. They're doing editing, they're doing release management, using our enterprise analytics, things like that. But yeah, we're pretty, and we're pretty happy with that number. Um, uh, very happy. Okay. 
Um, question: Major PLM vendors still rely on SQL databases. Modern data modern data processing cloud-based systems like Onshape are based on no SQL databases. Do you think there will be a shift to no SQL databases in the PLM industry? Yes, I think there will be a shift. And again, I kind of refer back to my earlier question about platform evolution. Sure, the legacy systems were all built on the old, older database technology, you know, 20, 30 years ago. We're on the modern database. It's a big advantage for us. It reflects in a lot of the advantages that users experience with us. And like I said, eventually, I think everyone in the industry agreed that they're moving our way. We're out ahead and doing it. And um, uh, yeah, I think there's just, it's clear that'll be the future. Okay, next question. I love what you're doing, but am but like most, I'm keen to see the functions I require developed. I don't have time to send in the forms to vote them up, but some of the functions I require, I feel, are not uncommon. As part of your scrums, do you seek functionality needs from industry experts in their field to ensure they have all the needs they need for end-to-end -end functionality? Um, yeah, I, we absolutely do seek your input, and uh, we get a um, we get a lot of uh, input from you. We get a lot of formal enhancement requests. And we also try to observe you. We go visit a lot. We, you know, obviously we can't visit anywhere near all of our customers, but I mean, many of you, we, we love visiting because we see things on site that we'll never hear about in a call. Um, and so, yeah, we're absolutely trying to seek out your input in that. That hopefully is why you're finding you know, every release, we get a lot of great feedback that what we're adding is very relevant and useful to you. Um, and uh, and we're doing it quickly. Every three weeks, there's a new release. So yeah, we, we definitely do um, seek and get input from our a whole array of customers. And definitely in the scrums and the meetings that plan what we, what we call sprints, for those of you who are familiar with Agile, we're constantly bringing the voice of the customer in. In fact, I'll often say in meetings, and I'm sure Cody and Kim have heard me and hopefully will confirm, I'll say if our customer were in the, were in the room, what would they say? What would they want us doing here? Um, it's something I take personally too. I sit through and watch. I just watched a user experience test we did the other day um, uh, on certain aspects of the product, on, on one that is released and one that's unreleased. And those of you who will do that with us too. So we triangulate from a number of sources and try, and I hope are succeeding at giving you a great basket of functions, uh, new functions every three weeks. All right. Has anyone attempted to integrate Onshape with their ERP or PLM system? Is there a guide available explaining the best way to accomplish this? Yeah, um, yes, we have a number of customers that are um, integrating with, well, you said PDM or ERP. Was that the question, Cody? Uh, ERP or PLM. Or ERP or PLM. So with both those, with both ERP and PLM, yes, customers are doing integrations using our API. I don't know that we've published a formal guide because those are very customized things. Again, if you reach out to us, um, you could start with support, or they'll refer you to someone else here, most likely, and we can talk to you about the best ways to do that. It works great because our API is available everywhere through REST APIs through the cloud. One, um, uh, also highly secure. We're able to provide PLM and ERP systems with metadata, with, with um, immutable URLs to versioned or revision level instances of CAD objects. That's a very cool property of Onshape that we can provide. And that works really well in these integrations, generally involving events in one system, triggering events in the other, triggering metadata and referencing data between systems. And so, yeah, let's, um, those, those have all been custom now uh, for the moment. We'll probably stay that way for the near term. Let's talk. Okay. How do you see Onshape supporting connecting multiple disciplines, um, not only mechanical design uh, aimed towards support or model-based systems? It, uh, did the refer to the, the term digital twins? Digital twins. Okay, well, that means a lot of different things to a lot of different people, of course. And so when you talk about multi-disciplines, it can mean everything from um, are we reading in, um, and of course we do, things like circuit boards. By the way, a very cool feature script um, feature for managing imported circuit board models 
um, check that out on the feature script page. I just thought I'd make that little plug there. It's a very interesting way of simplifying imported data. But in general, you know, we can, you know, there's importing cir circuit boards. To some people, multidiscipline, you know, can mean other things like working with, say, architectural CAD. And there, you know, we're, we're not aimed at building design. We have a lot of people doing building products. There's typically some form of either data exchange. To some people, multidiscipline means using our API with some of our partner apps. And so all of those things, um, different meanings. Cody, I'm trying to remember the, the end of that question to make sure I answered it. Um, so could you just refresh me there? Was there a part I didn't answer? Um, is there an expected way to accomplish this? Well, the, the effective way is to think about the use case you have. And think about what's you know what's the best way to get the the work done. Oh, you mentioned digital twin. Mm -hmm. So digital twin again, that means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, what's what's cool is with a cloud system like ours, you can put the data in so many other people's hands and connect it in so many ways through the API that it's just always there. So if you've got a colleague at a partner company, a vendor that isn't on site, and you want them to become Part of your design process, um, you can. they they once you give them secure authorization to access data, they can do it on any device anywhere, and they're always getting the real-time updated model. I know this is just echoing one of our core benefits, but in these kinds of cases, it pays off big time when you're sharing with other stakeholders doing other things, whether that's marketing, doing rendering, whether it's someone um, who considers this a digital twin for purposes of of maintenance or or um, connecting it to data sources that involve in-service data like IoT data. Again, all those things are there, but these are custom, you know, these are custom workflows and solutions that you put together around Onshape. All right, next question. How can Onshape help us manage variants of a design, often driven by a table that generates many bills of materials? Oh, so Onshape is awesome at managing um, variants through configurations. I mean, we're getting great response on our configurations approach. As many of you know, we're using it. Unlike traditional CAD configurations that get very, the, the tables explode in size when you, when you get um, more complex configurations. In Onshape, we manage that um, through a different approach to the, the uh, multi-level configuration tables that keep things very manageable. And then you combine that with feature script. And so we have a wonderful way to create um, configured designs very, very efficiently with much less code than traditional systems, much less complexity in the table, and with much better results for usability, robustness, and of course, managing. There's no upgrades to manage, everything's moved forward. So incredible solution. I see also in this question mentioning Bill of Materials, um, uh, when you say table driven by Bill of Materials, whenever you, uh, whenever you select a different configuration, you're going to see your simultaneous Bill of Materials um, update in the assembly with, uh, you know, when, you, when your assembly updates. Once you update an assembly that contains configurations, um, and we're expanding what configurations can do, and always uh, making it more powerful and comprehensive. Cody, anything to add there? No, I think that, that sums it up well. I think uh, we definitely have some unique aspects to configurations. Yeah. All right, so the next just, question. Go ahead. Sorry. Well, I was just going to add, I just had three customers were in talking to us about this, and, and we had three presentations of some fantastic customer solutions using combinations of configurations and feature script that in every case our customers felt would really translate into improvements in how their businesses run. These are some very serious complex use cases that you know they've tried to automate in the past with older systems and they've sort of automated it, but again, and they were amazing examples. I wish I could share them with you, but like all of your work, you know, we see your work, but we of course don't share them with people. Someday hopefully these will make it through to some of our case studies that you'll see on the blog or, or um, yeah, on, on our website. I, I really look forward to it, but there's beautiful work going on. All right. We even have customers, one last thing I'll add is, we have a couple of customers that are hiring 
um, their own staff to do configuration and feature script work. And that's something we didn't anticipate. I, 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 you know, I find it very interesting. They, they see so much potential that they want to dedicate a full-time person to implementing all the possibilities for custom parametrics and configs in their business. Sorry, just want to add that. No, that's okay. I, I've seen it myself. It is quite impressive. You know, some of those examples. So, um, okay. So. Is the CAD, this is a good question, is the CAD industry's dependence on the privately owned parasolid kernel a long-term problem? Do you see that as a long-term problem? And would you like there to be the equivalent of the Linux kernel, um, you know, where it's a free and open source version? Hmm. Well, um, you know, parasolid has now been kind of standard in the industry for um, a long time. And they've earned that. You know, they they earn it through through excellent um, technology, excellent evolution. Like, you know, you might say, well, it's old, but they're not afraid to re-architect it and make major changes. They're in the midst of this convergent modeling vision, which is a really incredible vision for incorporating mesh data and BREP data. Um, and I hopefully lattice data as well and a really comprehensive vision. I won't get into all the details of it here, but I'll just tell you that um, I give them A plus on their vision for convergent modeling. They've also been a great business partner in terms of the terms they do business on, the support services they offer, bug fixing, you name it. So, you know, it's really, it's a, it's a free marketplace in a sense. They've earned that, that right. They're not the only uh, modeling kernel out there. There are open source um, kernels out there, but they haven't acquired the following of, of uh, Parasolid. So it's, it's a free market, and as long as Parasolid keeps earning the lead, they'll have it. If someone could do a better job in the open source world, I think part of the issue is that the the um, in our case, it's a nice idea to have open source, but the, the users of modeling kernels are not typically the authors, as they are, say, in the operating system world. It's just a different market, and we just see different different behaviors. But um, uh, so I don't know if we'll see any other kernels come along, but I'm sure they'll continue to be challengers and Parasol will have to keep working hard to maintain their leadership. Next question. Do you have resources available to help us migrate from SOLIDWORKS PDM over to Onshape? Um, yes, we do have resources to help you with migrating PDM. We have a, um, a uh, technical services team here and depending on the particular case that help could be a few suggestions from um, from somebody um, in our customer success group to you know some sort of on-site visit or you coming here it all depends on the scope of what you're doing um, and the use case moving over you know to be a little more specific I find that sometimes the use case is to take old PDM vaults and move them over as an archive basis to say hey we just need to be sure that we can get at that data should we need it. It's basically an archive. That's one use case. Another use case is parts library. We're bringing over this PDM vault because these are a lot of things that we use as components in designs that are ongoing. Third use case is, is, um, is launching points for new products. We're bringing these, this over because we're in the middle of a project and we want to bring it in and start, you know, uh, you know, continuing the design or we regularly start new designs based on old designs. Those are just three example use cases that I've seen personally with customers and each one we can build different strategies for where the data comes over and and how best to um, to deal with it. But yeah, absolutely. If you don't know where to start, for those of you who know your Onshape customer success rep, you could start there, a great place to start. You can certainly ask in support, um, um, and there's a lot of online resources too. Cody, anything to add there? No, I think that covers it well. That's also part of um, you know what our team does as well, so we can meet, meet with you and discuss a strategy. As John mentioned, it's, it really depends on the company and what you plan to do with the migration. Oh, yeah, I almost forgot to mention that Cody is the manager of our technical services team. <laughs> So, so I can yeah. I can also meet and, and discuss that, yes. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, so 
question. Is it still the case that the typical paying Onshape customer is still using another program alongside like SolidWorks? Um, last time we surveyed our customers, the data we got back was 73% say we're their primary CAD system. 27% use us as a secondary system alongside others. And I would say that's probably, in my experiences, pretty close to all the other vendors. You know, like like everyone has some users who use it, SolidWorks or whatever. So, um, so no, I would say um, uh, uh, it's not the case, you know, it, it, it's not the case that users use us as secondary. It is the case that most users, most of our users use us as their primary system. Okay, question. I'm a longtime SolidWorks certified user, but the company I'm with uses Autodesk Suite products. What points would advise me to use to look at a move to Onshape? At what point? Yeah, I guess the the question I, I'm just paraphrasing here. What points would you make if you were looking to refer to someone, you know, moving to Onshape? Oh, you mean what points is and what are what what kind of points to make about it? Yes. Um. Yeah. So. Um. So. I would say, look, the 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 question I see all the time in companies, and when we meet with executives or larger companies or entrepreneurs starting companies is everyone wants to do more with less. They want to they want to get more designs done, they want to get more projects done in less time, spending less money. And the question is which solution is going to help you do that? And and yeah, everyone can build products with their old system. People like I said earlier there has been this long line of systems, you know, people were building products with paper before CADAM, people were building products with CADAM before computer vision, and they were building with computer vision before PTC and so forth. And so they, the question is, when does the cost of, of um, not switching hurt your business more than the cost of switching? And that's typically when you make the move. And when is there an opportunity in the, in the customer's business to make the move? You know, like, like if you're in the midst of locking down a design that you're trying to rush out to manufacturing, probably not the time to be starting a new CAD system, whether it's on shape or any other. But when you're starting a new product or when you're moving from concept into detailed design of a product and you realize the time benefits you're gonna get, you realize that your team's gonna be able to innovate more. We had the VP of a large company in here recently and he said, look, we're gonna be able to iterate more with on shape. We're gonna, we're gonna get, we're going, to, we're going to win more business because we're able to, to have a better product than our competitor because now we're able to only do two or three iterations. We're going to be doing 10 or 12, and our whole team is going to be able to see it globally. You know, these are the kinds of advantages that get people to make the move. So the points I'd make is it's really clear. Most, most everyone will quickly agree it's pretty obvious that someday they're going to be on Onshape or a system that looks like it. I don't think anyone disputes that. We get that all the time. The question is when. And I think the time is now if you look, either you or your competitor are going to switch first and you have to decide which one is, is going to, you know, is, is going to get the benefit of that advantage and you have to pick the right point in the process. Um, those are the reasons that I think people make the move. Sometimes it's about cost as well. You know, obviously on total cost of ownership, it's a huge win for us. Um, when you bring PDM into the picture, it's not even a fair fight anymore. You know, I mean, PD, any of you have deployed PDM. I'm not taking shots at it. Look, I built PDM years ago. You know, when you eliminate costs of servers, care and feeding for servers, customer story recently, you know, a server in Europe is running out of storage on one of their servers. If they upgrade that one, they have to upgrade them all worldwide. You know, you shouldn't spend any more time on that. And so when those things come up, big advantage for us. So there's so many points like that too to make, I think, but it's got to be the right time in your company. And again, Cody, anything to add? Go ahead. No, I think that, that sums it up well. Next question. How can an organization manage the constantly changing list of employees with access to our on-shape data as they come and go from the company? Oh, well, that's a huge, it's a huge advantage of on-shape to manage access to data as employees come and go. That's where there's a huge win with us because with us, um, you can you can control who has access to what um, in a way that you never could. The question to ask is not what you do with Onshape in that situation. It's what do you do if you don't use Onshape in that situation? Because then you're 
honestly, you're hosed there. I mean, you know, everyone, I see it all the time. You know, you, you, have, you have people with, with laptops and desktops and drop boxes that can access your company's digital data with no control. Once they have a file copy, you might lock it in a PDM vault, but to work on it, it comes down to laptop. So with traditional CAD, um, with traditional CAD, you know, with file-based CAD, you have a huge problem in that area. With Onshape, you have to remember that your company's master CAD data does not generally ever go to any user's computer, ever. And you can easily go in, I don't know how many of you have gone in the share box in Onshape, it's in all the additions to Onshape, and you can turn off download and copy permissions when you share a document, it's that simple. So I recommend that as a technique, you think about your company and just making sure you're using the power that we give you to really secure it. You know, think of that. You have someone in a remote location that's doing editing of your data, but they cannot take a copy, they cannot download it. Look, they can photograph the screen. I mean, they could do that, but that's a huge advantage for you. And then when you deprovision a user, you turn off their access to their account and that's it. They don't have any access, they don't have any software, and they certainly don't have copies of your data. So huge win for us. It's available in all our editions. In, in Onshape Standard and Pro, you have document by document securing. In Onshape Enterprise, you have what we call roles-based access control for setting up larger groups with permission sets and roles and things. For some, for some customers listening out there, if this sounds like something um, interesting to you, you really should check it out. It's what our people who want the most sophisticated level of control use, but it all, everything I've said just derives from the core advantage we have in this scenario that stems from having a true cloud architecture that doesn't copy files like the other systems. All right, next question. Blockchain technology becomes the norm and is becoming the norm in digital transaction. What are your thoughts about future effects of blockchain excuse me, blockchain technology on the CAD, CAE, PLM industry, as well as on Onshape. Oh, blockchain. Great question, uh, Cody. And by the way, I assume you picked it because it, it, after the last one, because it does sort of suggest things about security. First of all, I've been a big, um, big, um, I've had a big interest in blockchain um, since I started um, seeing it come out even before Bitcoin, there were blockchain technologies but particularly with Bitcoin, I actually own a 21 CO Bitcoin computer, if that means anything to anyone out there. Um, you can private message me and we can talk about it, but I'm always interested in learning about new, new technologies. So some of it is about securing um, and authenticating data. And in that area, that overlaps with everything I was just talking about that we do in Onshape. It's just what we do is an alternative way to achieve some of those effects, like auditing, like ensuring that you're at the right revision of data, like ensuring that your data is under your control. Um, but that doesn't mean we do everything that blockchain does. I'm just saying that the use case, the, the user need is met. There's some overlap with things we do in different ways. I think it's quite possible that someday blockchain will be used to do things like, like still be able to pass data in files and authenticate where it came from and meter the usage because the the danger the security danger posed by file copies is huge and while when people moved on shape they as i said a moment ago they eliminate it not everyone is moving on shape yet and there'll still be file-based workflows and people understand how insecure those are and so blockchain gives the potential to secure those in that you could say to someone okay i'm going to have to share this cad file with you i don't want to do it but I'm going to authenticate that uh, if you use certain kind of software that I'll know what you're doing with it. Um, it transactions that you make on that data, um, that I'll, I'll share a 3D printing file with you and know how many times you printed it, something like that. So I think there's potential for it, but um, it definitely use cases and I think we'll see some of those come along um, as one of many, uh, many ways, like I said, to secure and authenticate data. All right, so there's a question that's come up in a few different ways in a few different forms in, in the emails and also in the questions here. Um, when will we see assembly configurations? Is assembly configurations more challenging than you know feature configurations? So assembly configurations are really close, right, Cody? Yes, as I understand it, very close. 
Yeah, very close. So you'll see them soon. Um, uh, you know, we, we, we've seen it. I mean, I, I think it's no secret to say basically the R&D work is done and we're, we're just going through shakedown and UX testing and, you know, all the things we do before we release it to our whole user base. Um, and uh, they're awesome. Um, I think that I, I personally am quite happy with the way the, the team implemented it. As, as many around here know, I take a great personal interest in some of our user experience projects, sometimes to the annoyance of some of the people who work on those projects. But I really do try to care about what you do. I also recognize that I am personally not an expert user like you are. But um, anyway, I'm super happy with it. You'll see them soon. Is it more challenging than feature? configs. I think you'd have to ask the developers. My sense is that that the that getting the feature config done was was a very big project and a big challenge and the assembly configs came along, you know, more more moderately. It's real work, but again, it was just a question of getting around to it and against so many other things you want done. I hope you love them. Um Cody, you have anything to say about them? Are you happy with it? I think it's awesome, yeah. And and the other comment I would make about that is we have a very high bar for quality. Um, so unfortunately, that means sometimes things get delayed, you know, just because they don't meet that that criteria, and then they need to go back and and you know be modified for whatever reason. So I think in general, you'll notice about Onshape is that when we release features, they work very well and they're very stable, and that's part of you know the the QA process and the whole R&D team. So yeah, and you guys should know that people like Cody and Lou. We try to to think of them as internal advocates for your point of view. And I, like the way I ask Cody what he thinks of something, I'm not just doing that now on this webinar. I might really do that if I, 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 you know, if I saw him. I mean, I don't see Cody as often as some of the other people here in the building, but um, I will check with our internal usage experts um, to see what they think to get an idea if we're, we're meeting the right needs. But anyway, you'll see it really soon, I hope. And I hope you love it. Let me know. All right. So what is the end use percentage mix of Onshape users in industries, i.e. medical, industrial, machine design, consumer product? Wow. Great question. What is the end user percent? I got to be honest with you. I don't know off the top of my head. I'd love to give you data. Um, but I'll, you know what I'll do is I, I know that Kim can help me get some of that data offline. And so maybe, um, maybe we can... Um, uh, get that data and post it in the forums or something, Kim, um, yeah. after after the webinar. I can tell you that I would say it's pretty clear that machine design and what I'll call industrial equipment, what I would define as people who make things that become part of other things that that are used in, you know, that you, that the products that you wouldn't generally see as a consumer that go in, that are made, that go into other things. Um, you know, sensors, actuators, subsystems, things like that. Machine design and industrial, that's the biggest part of it. We do have a, a lot of medical and a lot of consumer as well. And actually a notable category for us is energy too. I'm just seeing a lot of companies that are either involved in, in um, well, I was about to say production of energy, but we don't really produce energy. We, we capture it from somewhere, but you get what I mean, energy production, um, and a lot of alternative energy um, companies, people who are like, we just did a story on Zing Mobility, fantastic company making um, electric drivetrain subsystems, battery motors, also making a whole electric vehicle, whole electric car, maybe the fastest electric car in the world, by the way, um, in Onshape. Um, a lot of people making uh, electric snowmobile company, Tega Motors up in Canada, another great Onshape customer. And we have many, many customers that are changing, you know, design, design, redesigns due to energy needs. That's that, that, but that's not going to be one of our major ones. Hope that helps. We'll try and get you some percentage data on that if we can. All right. So next question: Having to upgrade SolidWorks every year and dealing with the is issues of version incompatibility is becoming a real pain. Will Onshape free us from this problem as it appears? Question. Oh yeah, <laughs> you're upgrading upgrading SolidWorks every year. Yeah, on shape. I mean, it, you know, as your users out there, um, any of our existing users will tell you with on shape, you can say goodbye to all that upgrade nonsense. Um, we recognize it's just one of the one of the costs. Like I said earlier, when do you switch? When you start to realize how much time it's costing you to deal with stuff like that with the upgrades. 
And I see this problem getting worse, not better, because what I see happening is design involves more people in more locations at more companies than ever before working on a given project. And that just multiplies this problem. Yeah, I remember a user telling me, hey, I'm on version whatever it was, 2010, my customers on 2012, my vendors in 2009, what do I do? I don't know what you do. I don't have a good answer there. With Onshape, everyone in the world is on the same version of the system, the latest version. We upgrade everyone. Um, I'm not going to say upgrade problems have never, ever, ever happened. I would just say they're extraordinarily rare, and you'd have to work hard to find anyone who's ever seen anything like that. And so, yeah, um, yes, the short answer is yes. Onshape frees you from this. You just don't have to worry about it. And that advantage also multiplies when you do things like custom features where in old systems you're ending up in the software upgrade business with Onshape. Those should just all work every upgrade. We take care of that. You don't have to. Next question. Any plans for generative design? Generative, yeah. That's actually one I'd love to ask you guys for, for input on too. But our view on generative, yeah, we, we are partnering with the generative companies, um, Frustrum and Topology, uh, Paramatters. Um, uh, you know, we take data from all of them, from Altair, if you have it. Um, our, philo our philosophy has been when I talk to customers, I see a wide variety of use of the generative tools. And that's said to me, hey, this isn't an area that we need to invest in it's an area that we need to partner in and then we support the mesh data coming into onshape i want to make sure you're all aware of that if you optimize a part if you generate a part you bring in that mesh data right in your part studio we would and you can reference points on it that uh, will allow you to um to um measure it model against it you can section view it you know you can do all those things Look, we'd like to do more with the mesh data coming in. I think you will see us do more with it um, in the future. And again, it's guided to some degree by how much we hear from you about that. At the moment, I would say, you know, our user base seems pretty happy with, uh, with how we're handling it and um, pretty happy with our mesh import and uh, have some great use cases of people that are using it. But I like seeing it and, um, happy to hear about your adventures and would like to do uh do more as you as you need it will onshape make use of ai technology in the future ah ai technology great question i was just thinking about that this morning i had one of one of our employees asked me to meet on it uh has a really interesting idea on using ai I would say, um, yes, first of all, we already make use of it um, internally in the areas you you don't see. We're using it to improve the level of service we provide. Um, we learn things through through some um, AI, AI tech that help us. We'd like to deliver it to you in some good use cases. We explore those. I would say the, the one enormous advantage we have is by with our cloud architecture, we have a ton of data um, about what's happening. We, as you know, if you look, you have a ton of data too. If you look at your Onshape model, we store every edit, every transaction um, that you've ever made against your model, every hole you've drilled, every fillet you've made. So we start from this enormous advantage, as you know, modern AI and machine learning are driven by lots of data. And we have the most data that we capture for you. And so thus, the best launch pad. Stay tuned. I hope we have some good applications coming for you in the future. Okay, next question. Does Onshape have any plans to support IFC import-export? Uh, IFC, I believe, is the uh, industry foundation classes for like building material formats. Correct. Right now, no. I would say it's not a priority. We could do it if we had enough users. We have a lot of users in building products industry. And we're finding other ways to exchange data. Um, put in, you know, if that's important to you, put in an enhancement request, and we'll continue to take a look at it. But I haven't, um, I haven't heard that one bubbling to the top. Cody, have you? Uh, you occasionally hear from it, but it's not um, uh, heavily requested, or at least what I would describe as heavily requested. All right. So the next one: What would you say to someone that only knows how to use or starts with Onshape? 
It seems like the work environment requires SOLIDWORKS knowledge. Is that just something that will slowly change? Um, yeah, it's changing already. I mean, um, yeah, I mean, I'm flattered that so many people are using, you know, SOLIDWORKS, my old, old system, I'm certainly proud of it. Um, you know, I think that what you'll find is, is, um, is that's going to be changing. And um, I think that, first of all, a lot of, a lot of CAD skills translate, not all of them, but quite a few. Once you learn to think about feature-based CAD and parametrics, assembly mates, drawings, associativity, release management, if you know how to think about those concepts, just like I say about computer programmers, I'm not just saying that about CAD, but I always look at programmers not by the language they've learned, but by the skills they've developed, and I find those typically translate pretty well. But yeah, um, you're going to find, you know, each e learning each system has its advantages, and I think that um, clearly um, we're gaining more and more of the market every day. And um, but yeah, we won't, you know, you won't have the exact software skills if you have one brand of software and someone's looking for a different brand. You know, you you you'll have to overcome that. Um, I would add that learning learning to master cloud skills, um, I would recommend is a pretty good career <laughs> career knowledge to have uh, today in today's computing world. So that's a big thing, um, uh, a big plus point in our favor. Okay, question: Is there a way to allocate more resources? Can you tell if a document's running slowly? Is there things that we can do in the back end to speed up performance? Uh, so the question is, are the things that, that you, you as the user cannot do that right now? There's no way for you to do it. We at Onshape um, can and do do such things. So, um, so we, are, um, we can tell, we can monitor in different ways and cause um, different um, users and documents to have more resources where needed. And that is part of how we make Onshape work. Yeah, it's definitely a unique aspect of Onshape, I would stress, is that we can dynamically allocate resources, which is something you typically can't do in like a SOLIDWORKS scenario. You kind of fix to whatever is on the hardware. Um, the can other do, right? We're yeah. continually doing that, right, Cody? Right, right, and that's something that's unique to us. Um, the other comment I would make on this is definitely use the, the feedback tool, you know, the contact support under the help menu. Um, we could also give you advice, you know, tips and tricks for for speeding things up, and you know, little things that you could do to to make a big difference. But um, yes, we do. We can dynamically allocate resources, um, which is you know something that's unique to us. Okay, when? How many years in the future do you expect cloud-based CAD to dominate the industry? Uh, how many years in the future do we expect? That's a great question. You know, I, I I don't know. You know, when I mean, I think it depends what you mean by dominate. In Mindshare, I would say that that you know we are getting a ton of Mindshare in the industry, and that's really clear. I mean, like I said, there's there's very few people who would disagree that that you know our our approach is the future. So in Mindshare, I think we're where we've got a huge share right now in market share, obviously, as you know, you know, there's still, still a distance to come, but I don't know what you mean by dominate can mean different things. I mean, uh, the CAD market has never been a monopoly. There's always been multiple systems around and there, I think there always will. Um, but, and uh, I would just say that we're in, we're definitely in the knee of the curve now where each year is bringing huge growth to to, as I said, not just the mind share, but the reality of cloud-based CAD out there being used. And in fact, um, um, I just think it's, you're gonna see rapid growth, but I don't know what, what I would, I don't know how I would know when we were dominating or when it would be, it's hard to even understand that, but we do appreciate the growth and I think you're gonna see it continue to um, move at uh, a very fast rate. All right, we are out of time. So I, I apologize, everyone. I know there are a few questions that did not get answered, um, but we will be having you know one of these again at some point in the future. Um, so uh, just wrap things up with uh, John. You can wrap things up here with a big thank you. Yeah, I'll just say again, like when we open, thank you to our customers out there um, and our prospects. Those of you who are looking at us, um, we're proud to be your partner. As you can see. 
we're working hard every day to keep improving the tools and we plan to do that for a long, long time to come. And uh, these are great questions. I, uh, I'm sorry I couldn't answer them all, but I, um, we tried. <laughs> and, uh, um, uh, and, uh, uh, and thank you, Cody, as well. All right, everyone. Thank you and have a good day.